For him, this way, he continued his godfather fantasy. But in terms of violence, the craze were in a different league. They were the real bloody thing. The continuing high of drugs now began to take my life into another dimension, and without realising it, I slipped back into the world of easy crime. It wasn't the money I was after. I didn't need any. It was the buzz, the escape from the more normal life. Through Terry, I met a character I shall call Billy. He's part of a black team famous for a series of large-scale wage stenches. It all came about because Terry had witnessed me driving my Jaguar at ridiculous speeds down one-way streets, dodging other cars just for kicks. I could only do this because the amphetamine quickened my reflexes and made me oblivious to the risk. Having heard about my exploits, Billy asked me to take him on one of these wild spins. And on his word, I was catapulted into the role of getaway driver on a, on a big wage snatch. There was a lot of money involved, and while we were just talking about it, I felt very big. When I realised we were actually going to do it, the horrors set in, because without the amphetamine to give me the bravado, I was still like an insecure kid, scared of the dog. During the days to the run-up to the robbery, I imagined crashing the car and killing somebody. I wanted to get out, but it was too late. Billy came on very heavy when I expressed my doubts. On the morning of the job, very scared, I took so many pills I nearly overdosed. I was totally spaced out and we picked up the robbery cars. And the older man who never wanted me to part the team realised the state I was in and said, F up son and you're dead. I was now very frightened and wanted to run away, but things now began to happen thick and fast. In the rear view of the mirror, the getaway car watched as the gang ran the truck and with our, with our second vehicle. I began crying when I heard shouting and the breaking of glass. The driver was forced to open the way at the gunpoint it was all over in seconds, the men, men piled into the back of the car. I felt a gun press in the back of my neck. F up and you're dead, son. Those familiar words from the hooded face behind me. My foot hit the accelerator so hard we shot off like a rocket, but in a weird way the car didn't seem to move. Everything seemed to happen in slow motion. One of the robbers was being dragged along outside and somebody pulled him in through the window and moving cars. He screamed abuse at me. The older man hit him in the face saying, later, let the kid drive. We had a pre-planned route, but turning, up, turning the first corner, a delivery lorry blocked the entire road. I mounted the pavement with my hand on the horn, and suddenly a woman with a pram came out and two parked cars, but the speed we were driving was impossible to stop. She somehow pushed the pram out of the way and miraculously leapt to safety herself. As I hit and bounced off various parked cars, it felt like I was in a film with everything that had already happened. Constantly turning left and right, we were soon in the clear, and I realised that barring a stupid accident, I made it. I started laughing and crying at the same time. On reaching the third car, we piled out and vanished down a nearby underground station with the older man. Sitting on the train, he said, well done, son, you drove well. His words meant more to me than all the cash I was to receive later that day. It was this recognition I'd always wanted, not just the money. Since I was a kid, I, I, I just wanted to be accepted and belong to somebody. Sadly for me, it had to be a gang of robbers. I locked my share, several bags of, of, of cash in a flat, in, in the flat, out of Camilla's sight. It took me several days to get over the robbery, but I did with the help of my drugs, and went on to commit many more crimes. Under the influence of antetamine, I was doing didn't seem real anymore, it was just like a game. A few days after the robbery, we drove to the airport to meet Camilla's mother, Isabella, and her daughters visiting from, for Christmas. Isabella was stunned to see how thin I'd looked. I'd lost three stone in weight since I first saw her. My addiction, the crimes and the violence were taking its toll. And in spite of everything, I wanted to give Isabella and, and her girls a normal holiday. During our Christmas dinner, I stared at my family because the bloody drugs I'd forgotten that Camilla and Tessa even existed. That afternoon, noon, Louisa pushed Tessa on the swing and she fell off. Her crying jolted me back to reality. And picking up my daughter, I realised... I hadn't looked at her face for so long. For the rest of the holiday, I desperately tried to become part of the family and cut down on the drugs. We saw the lights in Oxford Street and the giant Christmas tree in Trafalgar Square. During those days of sanity, we also visited Petticoat Lane Street Market. We pushed through the crowds. I just took a look at these ordinary people leading ordinary lives without drugs. Why can't I be like them? The girls always clung to Isabella. That she was all they had. Watching them chat with Camilla, their mother, I found myself wanting so much to become part of that normality. Later that night, I listened to the new Rolling Stones record I'd bought. It's all over now. It made me feel sad, as if I knew my sanity wouldn't last. Saying goodbye at the airport, they flew back to Malta. I held hands with Isabella for what seemed like an eternity. 
She looked pale and tired, and there was something in her eyes as if she was going to say something. At home, with the Christmas ceasefire over, domestic war re-exploded one night. After dinner with Alan, I got home to find Camilla screaming her head off. She had failed her driving test. I bought a brand new transport car, which sat outside for weeks, waiting for her to pass her test. She failed and now ranted and raved, though it was me who hit the bloody curb with the three-point turn. Certain money was to ensure that even blindfold could pass the next test, second time round. I was prepared to do anything, pay anything, just to keep the status quo. Some months later, early that morning, Camilla became screaming again, demanding a house. We can't bring a child up in a flat. She needs a garden to play. Calm down, I replied, I'll buy one before I come home tonight. Taking the carry bag of cash, I went to see Terry, as I always did in times of trouble. I must get a house today, I cried. I didn't go home tonight without one. I can't face another day. Luckily, Terry knew a solicitor desperate to sell his house in Tottridge. If he's got a garden, I'll buy it. The money's in the car. We rang the owner and immediately went to see him. He wanted to show me around the house. He just said, my wife can look later, name your price. He looked bewildered, named the sum, more than it was worth, which I accepted without the query. I just wanted peace. Apart from the small amount, I paid them in cash and the carrier bag. Thank God, no rouse tonight at all driving home. We spent the fortune renovating the new home. I had no interest in the decorations. To me, it was only represent dipping into another carrier bag of cash. The huge detached house had five bedrooms and long sloping garden, opening, opening up onto open farm. <coughs> this unrestricted view was a rare thing in London, but I was too stoned to appreciate it. My father became involved and helped organise the numerous builders. He was changing towards me, trying to get closer. Helping Camilla in, in the house was the first time he'd shown any interest in what I did. Was his friendship due to my new affluence, or had he discovered me as a sort as a son for the first time. I didn't want to know the real answer. I enjoyed his attention too much. Dad's shop had gone broke, and because he was too old to work properly, I began to send him 25 quid a week. Recently, I bought him a new car, all part of my money by his love formula. Like many others, he wondered how his 21-year-old 21 21-year-old 21 son had suddenly acquired so much wealth. To celebrate moving into the new house, I took my parents and Camilla to dinner in a fashionable talk of the town talk of the town. Sitting in the best seats, sitting in the best seats by the stage, we looked like a happy bunch, like a happy bunch, still clinging to the dream of creating a, a family who loved me. I wanted to get my wife and parents closer to each other. In spite of all the drugs and crimes, part of me <coughs> wanted to slow down. We were just starting to enjoy our meal when I felt a hand on my shoulder. One at our table. But I can't come now. We're in the middle of a celebration. Now, if you ever want to celebrate again. I'll be over in a moment. Oh no, it's a Craig Brothers. Yes, Dad. I'll be back in a tick. <coughs> We've got someone for you to meet later on this evening. We'll meet you at the hotel in Sydney Street. Last part of town. We'll see you there in an hour. Don't be late. Oh, what do you want? We've got some business for your stockbroker friend. What's wrong? You look ill. <coughs> it's nothing, Dad. Listen, something's urgent just popped up. I'll need to call you a cab. Waiter! An 
hour later.